Hello everyone, you're listening to Lipstick and Leather, and I'm here with my friend Sean Kelly in Toronto. How's it going today, Sean? Oh, it's going well, Ryan. How are you? Good. This is the earliest interview I've ever done in my life. Well, you know, you're, you're interviewing a rock and roll dad, so uh, that's uh, my, my day started at five, 5 o'clock. Holy morning. cow. Hey, <laughs> it all works out. <laughs> Indeed. Now, you've been in the Aaron's band for a while. Um, did the Frank Greiner connection have something to do with you getting the gig? Uh, Frank Greiner and Lee Aaron? Mm-hmm. No, um, I didn't know that those two were connected. They were at some point, and plus I know she produced, uh, he was on the latest album too. Uh, well here, okay, so we'll go back. Yeah. So I met Lee Aaron through uh, my Metal on Ice book. I interviewed Lee uh, when I was writing the book. That's right. And then we did a companion album to go with it, and on the companion album we redid a version of Metal Queen. Mm-hmm. So I was in Vancouver, and uh, I was actually working with her in the studio on her vocals for that. And the talk came up of, hey, I'm going to be doing some Ontario shows. Would you be ever interested in playing guitar? And of course, I, I jumped at it. I'm a hugely Aaron fan. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was four years ago, and it's turned into an incredible, most importantly, an incredible friendship. But um, yeah, a great working relationship that extended to a writing relationship to, yeah, we're now, you know, promoting a second album that I've been involved with. That's uh, right. Diamond Baby Blues. But Frank, Frank was involved in the new record. Uh, he was, he engineered the guitar mm-hmm. tracks right. for me in Toronto. That's, that's the extent of his, his involvement in that. Cool, cool. Yeah. Now on the new topic of the new Learn album, Great City, now there's five cover songs on it. Has she talked maybe about doing a full cover album or a cover EP sometime down the road to you? No, I think her, her motivation for doing, uh, I don't even call it a cover cover versions. It's more like reinterpretations. I mean, I know that's semantics, but but uh, the idea was just to find great songs for her to sing. Whether we wrote them, she wrote them, or she found them and we reimagined them, that's the whole point. It's really a Lee Aaron record. It's not a Lee Aaron cover record. That's the way I look at it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, we're actually starting the process of writing for another record now. Just shooting ideas back and forth. And, uh, yeah, she'll take it where she wants to take it. Right on, looking forward to that. Yeah. Now, can we expect more material from Trapper? That's the dream, you know? Trapper <laughs> is is really, I always say Trapper is M. Griner and my teenage fantasies kind of come to life. Like, that was the whole point. Let's make records and, and, and do covers and write songs that, you know, we always wanted to do and the style we always wanted to do. and. You know, that band just kind of took on a life of its own when we got the Def Leppard dance, That's right. right. We went on tour with Def Leppard through M's uh, great friendship with Joe Elliott. And, uh, you know, it's tough because that's a band, and the band is so good. I love the band. I love our relationship. But, you know, we have careers that we, you know, we're making our livings off of. It's hard to start a new band because any new band, you start from scratch, you're not making a lot of money. Um, and it's hard to turn down our paying opportunities, mm-hmm. you know, to, to start an event. But listen, we definitely will do something again. I work closely with Frank. I'm actually working with Frank on some new Honeymoon Suite music. Uh, Frank and I are going to be doing a whole bunch of projects together on the production side. Um, I can't help but think that we're going to do some new music at some point, but there's nothing in the immediate future. Okay, gotcha. Now, you joined Gilby Clark on stage recently. Have you guys discussed working together again? Well, yeah, we were... Um, You know, Gilby and I did a guitar clinic a couple of weeks ago in Calgary with Bumblefoot, which was great. And uh, yeah, and I I got up and jammed with Gilby when he's in town. Listen, we're we're great friends. I had the great privilege of being in his band for a couple of years. Um, Yeah, I mean, that's that door is always open, I believe. And I I love working with him. He was a great producer for Crash Kelly, great mentor, and uh, and I I love being in the band. So yeah, I would welcome the opportunity. Hopefully, it happens. That would be awesome. Yeah. Now, Crash Kelly has been writing for a new album since 2012. Well, 2018 or 2019, have a new Crash Kelly album. Yeah, we're what, what's actually it's funny. Uh, what we're we're working on right now is I've got three new songs fully written, and and the process is beginning. And I actually just just uh, I can't say the name yet, but I've just been approached by a label uh, to, to to put out. Uh, I think we're going to start with a single. Okay. And there could and a full length. Looking for a full length in early 2019. Uh, but hopefully a single coming out as early as the end of the summer. That would be awesome. So it's, it, it's moving pretty quickly and uh, I found a great label partner. Um, well, I look forward to sharing the news with when I can, but uh, I always wait till the ink's dry. <laughs> Absolutely. 
Now, how did you get involved in 2015's D. Snyder's A Rock and Roll Christmas? That came about because um, I played in a band, an American band called Four by Fate. Uh, and the manager of that band was a guy named Danny Stanton, a good friend of mine, and he has uh, he is the president of a company called Four Entertainment, who are also uh, Twisted Sisters agents. So we played with Twisted Sister in Belgium on a festival, the Alcatraz Festival. Um, and then sometime shortly after that, I was made aware that Dee was putting on this musical, and I, I, I kind of really, on a whim, just reached out to Danny and, and very half-heartedly kind of said, I, fu I, I fully wanted to. It, it wasn't half-hearted in, in intention, but I said, uh, you know, hey, man, I, I don't know what's going on with this Dee Snyder musical, but I love Dee. I'm, uh, Twisted Sisters are a massive influence on me. First song I ever learned to play was We're Not Gonna Take It. And I said, I'd love to be involved playing guitar in it. What I didn't realize was that the gig actually is not just playing guitar, it was acting and dancing, and singing and doing the whole kind of musical thing. Uh, but I went for it and I auditioned and um, I think they needed a guitar player who could kind of play in that 80s style, mm. but they also needed someone who could act and dance and, and I do sing a bit, but uh, they needed someone who could act and dance. I said, I don't do those things. So they actually sent an acting coach to my house after I did the first audition for a crash course, a six hour crash course in acting, to just to go back so when D came and I auditioned, and you know what, it worked out and it was, I gotta tell you, it was uh, probably the greatest professional experience in my life in terms of the amount of hard work that went into it, the challenge and the reward. It was just so, I love the multifaceted nature of what happens in a musical theater show, you know? Mm -hmm. it, was, it was great, very rewarding. Absolutely. Now for one night, the super group of Carl Dixon, Mark Santers, Tim Harrington performed a night of Pony Hatch music. Did you, would you ever do this again down the road? It's funny you mention that. I guess this is the first interview I'm saying, but I'm actually playing guitar with Coney Hatch now. No kidding! And we are going to be going out on tour with Steve Harris's British Lion. Oh, so uh, yeah, that's that's happening. I, uh, I'm, I'm honored to be kind of taking that that uh, that guitar slot and. Uh, and going on tour. So yeah, and actually I'm getting together with Carl Dixon more and do some writing. I don't know what we're writing for, but we're just starting up. We're going, this will be the first time we're going down the, uh, the road of writing together. But I, I played with Carl uh, in his acoustic group. I actually played some dates with Coney Hatch in the, in the past yeah, too. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and then, but that, that, I remember that, we did two shows with that lineup. We did one was in uh, Cambridge, at uh, Cambridge Fall Fair. I think we played with Honeymoon Suite. And then one we did, uh, that was Carl's uh, Night Alone. Where was that? Tony's East or something. Anyway, great. Uh, that was a great band. Mark, I can't say enough about Mark and Tim as musicians. And hey, man, I'd, I'd also welcome the opportunity to play with them again any day. Absolutely. Now, you've been friends with Mr. Brian Vollmer for a long, long, long time. And Brian being friends with Sebastian Bach. Did you guys reach out to, did you reach out to Sebastian for Metal on Ice to contribute to either the CD or the book? He, he Sebastian was uh, mentioned in the book and I actually had my friend Aaron Small uh, kind of talk about Sebastian in his role um, in the Canadian music scene but I didn't I didn't interview Sebastian directly no. I would have loved to though because I, I think you know it's funny I play with Carol Pope and I know Sebastian and Carol are friends so I feel one day our paths are gonna cross and I know Sebastian gave me a nice mention on uh, you know the book of, on Facebook and everything so that's cool, uh, but you know, I've never had a chance to meet him, but I'd love to meet him, I'd love to work with him. Mm -hmm. So if you ever tell, talk to him, tell him I said so. <laughs> I will definitely do that. Now, were there any musicians who weren't interested in being involved in Metal on Ice that you approached? No, uh, everybody was pretty receptive to it, because I mean, really, it wasn't, uh, you know, it wasn't a trashy tell-all book, right? Metal on Ice was, uh, I think, but the, the goal of Metal on Ice was to give these bands who played such an important part in Canadian music history their due. So, I mean, it was really a historical book. And, and giving these bands a voice in the context of Canadian music history. So, I think most bands were really into it once they found out what, what the main thrust of the book was, right? Mm -hmm. and it, was, it was a reasonable pledge thing, too, because a lot of them I find overpriced, but I mean, I got mine signed by everybody for the price, it was great. It was yeah, great. Well, well, I mean, the whole, reasonable. Thing, the whole point was to put, it, it wasn't a money maker at all, it was, the whole point was just to, uh, you know, uh, have, have a document, you know, that, that whole album came about because I was working for a music management company at the time, Coalition Music, uh, on, with artist development, I was working with some of their artists, and doing some music directing, and had an artist development program. And uh, they, the, the two founders of the company, Rob Lanny and Eric Lawrence, were 
fans of this music, like grew up with this music. They, when they heard I was doing a book, they said, hey, why don't we, you know, we got a label through Warner Music, let's put out a record. So mm -hmm. we did this thing and it was a great experience. I'm very grateful to Coalition for all the work they did. We put on a once in a lifetime concert at the Opera House with all those singers. It was just fantastic. Absolutely. Being a huge fan of production, who would your ultimate choice be as a producer? To, to, someone to produce it? Yeah. Well, Crash Kelly, any project. Lane, you know or... what? I think there's a couple of people. Uh, Bob Ezrin would be somebody I would love to work with. Um, yeah, I think Mutt Lang, I mean, just in talking briefly with the Def Leppard guys, just to hear what, what he really brought to the table, and I mean, that's well documented in all their interviews. Uh, I think that'd be a, a really fascinating experience. Yeah, between Ezrin and Mutt Lang, I think he had, you know, covered it, but there's so many great oh, producers, yeah. right? Go back to the 60s, 70s, Tom Dowd would be an amazing guy to work with. Um, you know, uh, Andy Johns would have been rest of soul. Oh yeah, a great, uh, great producer to work with. Uh, Ted Templeman, Bob Rock. There's a million. Bob Rock. Right? You know, I love to work with Bob Rock. I've got to tell you, we worked with uh, Lee Aaron produced the last two records that I worked on mm -hmm. with her, uh, but she worked alongside John Webster, who was a, such an important part of those all those Little Mountain Sound records. Uh, with working alongside Bruce Fairburn and Bob Rock. And uh, we actually did those two last year at records at the old Little Mountain Sound with John, uh, you know, at the Sonic kind of helm. And uh, that was an incredible experience. Yeah. So, yeah, Bruce Fairburn would have been another one. Absolutely. Anyway. Now, being a big Wild Arts fan like myself, have you ever reached out to Ginger to do some writing at some point? No, but that would that would make sense. I'd love to write with them. We, I think, we changed exchanged a couple of emails many many years ago, but they were really just kind of friendly emails. Uh, but he would be an amazing, amazing person to collaborate with. He's just so prolific, and, and the amount of work and it's such high quality work. You know, mm -hmm. he'd be a great guy to work with. Absolutely. Now, what's the story with Alistair that happened on the UK tour in Southampton? What happened? Well, well, yeah. Well, I mean, it wasn't just Alistair. There was, uh, it was all of us. How do I put this gently? I guess enough times passed. I think the statute of limitations is out. But uh, basically, we were in a rock and roll tour bus doing rock and roll things that involve certain substances. Uh, not, nothing crazy, but uh, some people were partaking. And we got pulled, our bus got pulled over because there was an expired sticker by the police. And as we got pulled over, one member of the touring party had something that was a little more extreme in terms of substance. <laughs> had to consume it quickly. And uh, we got searched and they found some stuff, but they didn't find the real bad stuff. And it was, uh, we were sweating. So, I mean, Alistair was, you know, clean living, kind of, you know, teetotaling guy. He he probably took it maybe the hardest, but maybe not. I was taking it pretty hard too at the time. <laughs> but you know what? Rock and roll, we skated on it. They let us go. I think we even posed for some pictures with the police. And once they heard we were playing with the choir boys, they thought that was cool. So anyway, that, yeah, little rock and roll adventure. It's, it's, it's funny that some of these things that when you think back on that we got away with back then, it's like, oh my God, I just wouldn't, as a father now, I just wouldn't even conceive of it. But. Back then, you know, Crash Kelly did a pretty good job. Some of us that live in the rock and roll life, you know, Absolutely. for better or for worse. <laughs> now, with side A of One More Heart Attack being recorded in LA and side B recorded in Toronto, this would yeah. make for a great vinyl release, along with any of the Crash Kelly albums. Has there ever been talk of this happening? Well, yes, it's it's something that I, I actually own the masters to One More Heart Attack. So um, the licenses I had for those albums in Japan and, and, and uh, North America and uh, yeah, it was only in Japan and North America where that record came out. Uh, I, I could uh, issue that to somebody, and in fact, I'm gonna be in talks with somebody soon about that. The other two albums actually belong to uh, Century Media, which is now part of Sony. So I'd have to talk to somebody there, but I would love to see those records come on vinyl. It's, it's funny, I was just talking to Balmer, and the Helix records that I worked on, they're gonna all be seeing a vinyl reissue, starting with Bastards yes, yes. and Blues. And, um, yeah, I think that that's a wonderful document. You know, the new Lee Aaron record's coming out on vinyl. Just got the Helix uh, Universal Greatest Hits come out on vinyl. Uh, the Honeymoon Sweep record I worked on, I wrote with, that came out. It's nice to have that. So that, to me, is still the ultimate music format. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, any truth that the main reason Side B was recorded in Toronto was due to spending the Alice Cooper money on tour? Yeah, well, you know, 
this is another thing that could get me in a little trouble, but uh, I don't think so. What happened was after that tour, we were we had a record deal with Century Media with Liquor and Poker Music, and that that record we got dropped. But uh, I had fortunately. Uh, we had just come off that tour and, and we did really well on merch on, on that tour. So I had the merch money. Hmm. And so, I mean, you know, I figured, you know what? I think I got one more record in me. Let's invest this. Let's, let's spend it back on, on the band. So yeah, it was, it was the money we made on merch. And you know, it was, uh, yeah. And in retrospect, I think it was a great choice. Absolutely. Because I, that money could have gone in a lot of places, but it went into something that's still around today. And I, I'm, I'm very pleased with that. Very true. Now, how close was Eric Singer to drumming on One More Heart Attack? Oh, you know, that's pretty good research. We talked about it. Um, I wouldn't say it was super close, but, you know, I, I actually ran into him at a NAMM show, I think, and mentioned it. Uh, and Eric is friends with Gilby. Uh, it could it could have happened if schedules would have aligned. He, Eric expressed some interest in it. Not that he would remember now, but, uh, um, yeah. Yeah. It, it, it could have happened, but you know, we ended up having Brian Tishy play drums on, on the tracks in LA, and then the Crash Kelly drummer, Tim Timlick, who's still gonna, who's actually playing on the new record, he did he took care of the Toronto stuff. So I had two great drummers, so worked out. Love the tune Cracked and Faded. Now, what's Chipsy enough input in the song? Yeah, that was from Electric Satisfaction. Mm -hmm. uh, cracked and Faded. What, sorry, what was the question? What was his input? Because he didn't have if he was a co writer or if he played bass on it. Who's that? Chipsy enough. No, he didn't play on that. Did he didn't have any involvement in Crack and Fade or any of that. No, no, no. The only the only involvement is that he, he, he probably played a song with that groove because I don't, 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 don't. I think there's a song with that groove on the first Enough's Enough record. Okay. But uh, but no no. I, I we toured with Enough. Yes, Enough. he did with Johnny Monaco singing. With Johnny Monaco singing, but no, Chip Chip didn't. Uh, no, he didn't. He didn't. Kind of on the topic of your shirt and a very cool song to cover since you've been gone. Um, how do you guys think about covering that song? I regret it. Really? I'm gonna tell you right now, I regret it because, man, that Petty Pills, I'm really proud of that record, but I got my ass handed to me when we toured in England because that song is like an anthem for those people, and I can't sing like Grant Bonnet can sing. So I did. I had this idea I'd sing it like Ace Frehley or something, right? And uh, yeah, in retrospect, I think it was a mistake, <laughs> to be honest with you. Kind of like, you know, the English fans that know Uncertain Terms let me know, we love this record, but you shouldn't have covered that song. And I said, you know what, you're probably right. So part of me regrets it, but uh, but I mean, I love the song. I love the cover you guys did Oh, first thank you. Song. And you know what? I think it was kind of a thing where people either loved it or hated it. So, uh, I, I, hey, at least no one was in the middle on it. So, yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> Now, you had the opportunity to open for Alice Cooper, of course. Has Alice commented on the cover of Cold Ethel? He did, and he played it on his show. And that was uh, the last tour date we did with him. And I'll, you know, you remember these things in, in Kalamazoo. He, he turned around to me as he was walking out, and he said, hey, man, you know, good job on that cover, and uh, I'm playing it on Nights with Alice Cooper. I said, okay, well, that's about as good as it gets, you know, and I, and I am proud of that. That's one I, I think we nailed and had Nick Walsh mm -hmm. from Slick Toxic and, and our old band Revolver and he yeah. now would sing the famous underground. Uh, he, uh, yeah, he, he did a great job. I mean, it was, it was, I'm really proud of that one. That one turned out great. Absolutely. Did you ever record a vocal cover of it? What's that? Like for a demo, did you ever record a vocal cover? So I know, um, yeah, Nick Walsh, of course, sang it. No, I, I sang it too. It was a duet. Right, okay. You actually can't tell where Nick and I end up. We both, I think both of our Alice's were pretty good on that. No kidding. That's awesome. Now, will any of your material recorded with Rhythm Slaves ever be released? No. We did it. That Rhythm Slaves. Oh my God, you're going back. That was, that, you know what? I love that band. That was my high school band. And uh, my buddy Bob Lyle, uh, God love him, he's, uh, you know, we had a lot of fun. That was my first band where I was actually out, you know, going on the road a bit, played my first arena show with that band. Um, we, I think Bob has like the, you know, that's all recorded on two inch tape, right? So yeah. Like, the only thing we had, we made cassettes of that. that. That was our demo that we would give to clubs and stuff. Yeah, I think we got played on the radio a couple times in North Bay, Ontario. That's about it, though. So I don't think it's ever going to see the light of day. <laughs> I'd love to hear it, though, again. Oh, no kidding. Or maybe I wouldn't. I don't know. <laughs> now, what about the 1992 obscured Suck EP? Would that ever get released? Of course, it was Jamie Stewart from the call. Yeah, that was, you know, I have, I do have cassettes of that. I should digitize that stuff. Will it ever be released? I don't know. I mean, 
you know, like, those were that was an interesting time, right? Like, that was, uh, the one thing I, when I listened to that and I, I appreciated was that we were really adventurous and trying new things. It was also a big transition time, right, between kind of like the hair metal and the classic rock mm. and grunge and, you know, yeah, I, I think that, I think it, there's some interesting stuff. Would it hold up to the test of time or would anybody be interested? I don't know, but it was certainly a great experience working with Jamie and it gave me some, uh, a real valuable insight in the music industry. It was a real thrill. I mean, I was a 18 year old guy working with, you know, somebody I considered like a real super rock star, right? So it was mm. wonderful memories, let's put it that way. <laughs> yes. Now, Crash Kelly have opened for a Wasp. Did you get to chat with Mr. Black yet? Yeah. No, I don't even think we were supposed to look him in the eye. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what's funny? The guy I did talk to that night was Stet Howland. Oh, yes. And we went out and hung out a little bit, and then years later, Stet and I ended up being in Four by Fate together. That's right. Stet's a great guy, man. What a great, beautiful guy, and uh, great drummer. Yeah. But no, didn't didn't talk with Blackie. <laughs> but you know what? I love the guy. I, I, I really respect him, and I love the man. Absolutely. Now, there was talk way back in the day of yourself writing a book called Hair Metal for Hipsters. Yeah, there's, you know, that's that's still an idea that I'd like to pursue. There's also, a, there's a couple of book ideas, but listen, one thing I found with writing Metal on Ice <clears throat> was that it takes, it, it, it takes a lot of time to write a book. It's a real commitment. I had the time before, because when I was touring with Nelly Furtado, I'd go sit in the back of the bus and, and write, and I, I just, I had more time. Now my life with my kids, mm -hmm. and music, and teaching, clinics, and all these other things I do, it, it, it's pretty packed, and, and I think that, uh, it's, let's put it this way, it's a possibility, and I have talked to a few people about a new book, and it's something I will do at some point in my life, I just don't know if it's going to be in the immediate future. Fair enough. Now, in 1989, you had a band called White Rabbit. Did you record or write anything no, about the band? No, that was, that was a, 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 what they call a top 40 band, and that was kind of, that, that was my first band where I first, you know, I think it was 15, playing in bars, and, uh, yeah, it was a fun band, man, and uh, yeah, and a lot of good memories, a lot of good memories, uh, and it kind of fueled the fire to want to do things, but it was it was a cover band. Mm -hmm. yeah. How did you get the Carol Pope gig? That's through my friend, Tim Welch. Tim is an incredible guitarist, you know, I played with National Velvet, uh, Del Bello, he's a very prolific uh, and successful TV and film composer, and he played... He's been playing with Carol for years, okay. like, like I think close to 30 years. And uh, yeah, one day uh, in 2005, he said, hey man, our bass player can't make it. You want to sub in on a gig? And I was like, of course. So I learned it and I was, you know, played, I played a little bass. So I, I, I got, did that one gig and man, here we are in 2018, we're playing this summer. So I mean, been 13 years, she's incredible. She's such a, a true artist, you know, mm -hmm. an amazing singer. Now you did a Huggin' Dogs commercial with Craig McConnell. Is there any way to hear this? No, because you know what? <laughs> that, I, that's funny. I, I don't even know how you know that because it actually, I don't even think it got released. Okay. I think we got the gig and then it didn't, uh, I think they went with another song. So no, <laughs> there's no way. <laughs> but it is recorded. Very cool, yeah, very I, cool. I mean, I've done a few jingles over the years. Funny app too, right? I did, that one I did and I actually sang on that one too. That one did get released. That was cool. I, I remember going to a baseball game and hearing that. You know, they played it over the big thing. So, you know, it, it was cool. But I, I, to be honest with you, I, I dabbled in that world and I played on a few sessions. You know, my friend Craig was very successful in that world. And he kind of brought me in a couple times, but it, it, it wasn't really my forte. I don't have the patience or, uh, you know, the, uh, yeah, it, it's not where I wanted to spend my time. Mm -hmm. Let's put it that way. But, I, but I, I was grateful for the work I got in that world when I was working in it. Fair enough. Yeah. Now, with yourself being a guitarist and a Poison fan, I'm curious, what are your thoughts on Crack a Smile and Native Tongue? Uh, you know what? Uh, those albums, Crack a Smile, less so. I, I, I you know, I, I kind of, I, I, I own it, but I, but it, it doesn't really resonate with me. Native Tongue, though, I have to say, I went back and listened to that again. It's, it's really quality. Work. I agree. Brett Michaels is a quality songwriter, and, uh, and and I don't think he gets his due. Um, and, and I just love that guy's work ethic. I, I, but I, uh, to be honest with you, I'm, I'm much more of a fan of the, uh, you know, those, those early albums with CeCe. Mm -hmm. And I think CeCe DeVille is vastly underrated as a rock and roll guitar player. Listen, is the guy, you know, he, he might 
not be the most technically proficient player, but in terms of well-composed guitar solos with the great rock and roll attitude and a great singer, I love his vocals and a mm -hmm. great songwriter. I love Samantha Seven. Yeah, man, me too, me too. And 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 to me, he's the Johnny Thunders of hair metal, uh, with with the fire and like a man. You can take a run at some of those fast licks, and he hits a couple of them, you know. Once in a while, but <laughs> you know, it, it's funny. It, to me, it's not about uh, technical proficiency. I could care less about that. Mm -hmm. He's he. I, I would put him up as one of my favorite guitar players in terms of a guy who makes me smile, makes me feel good when I hear him play. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have I have lots of love for CC the Bill. Did you go see their recent show in Toronto? No, no. I, I really wanted to. I had a ticket. I you know I had the opportunity to go. I just I just couldn't. And cheap trick opening. Like I mean, mm -hmm. it's it's really tough for me, Ryan, because. If I'm not on the road, I want to be home with my family. Yeah. And my mornings are really important to me. My, t my time with my kids, I'm really kind of in that family mode right now. So anything that takes me away, even, you know, we're talking about LA Guns tonight. I'd love to go see LA Guns tonight. But I want to be at my best when I wake up in the morning and I got to maximize my time. Mm -hmm. uh, time is short. I, I have lots of work I want to do. And it's more important for me to do the work. You know, I've seen Poison a few times. Amazing. Yeah. Uh, but no. Well, on the topic, thank you very much for making time for me to do this interview. You're welcome. My pleasure. Yeah, sorry it took so long. Yeah, that's life sometimes. That's it's all worth in the long run. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right.